Hello, my name is Bryce Davinacia, a third year medical student at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Today, I will be covering the ocular manifestations of sickle cell disease with a focus on sickle cell retinopathy. First, some background about sickle cell disease. It is the most common type of hemoglobinopathy affecting populations with endemic malaria, most commonly of African descent. Around 100,000 people in the United States have sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is a result of multiple genotypes. The most common is hemoglobin SS, affecting 0.4% of African Americans. The most pertinent to this talk is hemoglobin SC, as a result in a higher prevalence of sickle cell retinopathy. This genotype has a prevalence of 0.2% in the African American population. The reason this genotype presents with higher rates of proliferative sickle cell retinopathy is not known. A rare cause of sickle cell retinopathy is sickle thalassemia, where the patient has one copy of hemoglobin S gene and one copy of beta thalassemia. Some ocular manifestations can be observed in sickle cell trait, where the patient has only one copy of hemoglobin S. This affects 8% of the African American population. Sickle cell disease is caused by a point mutation in the beta globin gene, resulting in the 6 amino acid substituting valine for glutamic acid. This valine substitution causes beta globin to polymerize when not bound to oxygen. Small capillaries require a red blood cell with a flexible membrane to pass through. Sickling of the blood cells occurs during hypoxia, acidosis, or dehydration, as these are the states where oxygen is not bound to the beta globin. Sickling causes the red blood cells to have a rigid membrane and occlude small vessels while damaging the arterial endothelium. Occlusion causes downstream ischemia and induces vasoproliferative changes. Sickle cell disease affects many organ systems and can affect every part of the eye. With regards to the orbit, bone marrow content increases in the orbital bones of small children, resulting in lipedema, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and diplopia. Anterior segment complications include the conjunctival or comma sign and vision-threatening hyphema, as seen here, when the rigid, sickled red blood cells cause dangerously increased intraocular pressure. The focus of this lecture will be on the complications associated with the posterior segment, specifically proliferative and non-proliferative retinopathies. A rare but serious cause of vision loss is central retinal artery occlusion, resulting in retinal ischemia. Commonly, angioid streaks have been reported lesions in patients with hemoglobin SS and sickle cell trait. Ocular manifestations of sickle cell disease usually occur in hemoglobin SC genotypes, or sickle thalassemia, with 33% and 14% presenting with complications, respectively, compared to just 3% in hemoglobin SS patients. Sickle cell retinopathy is divided into five stages that progress from benign changes to severe complications. Stage 1 involves peripheral arterial occlusions. Stage 2, peripheral arterial venous anastomoses. Stage 3 presents with neovascular and fibrous proliferations that have a C-fan appearance. The final two stages are complications from neovascularization. Stage 4 is vitreous hemorrhage, and stage 5 is retinal detachment. Non-proliferative sickle cell retinopathy includes the first two Goldberg stages, defined by peripheral arteriolar occlusions leading to peripheral non-perfusion and subsequent arterial venar anastomoses from pre-existing capillary channels. These changes affect the peripheral retina and therefore are not associated with vision loss. Some findings associated with these changes are salmon patches, black sunbursts, and refractile spots. Salmon patches are areas of intraretinal hemorrhage from superficial blood vessels that occur following a peripheral retinal arterial occlusion. These are salmon color due to hemolysis. Black sunbursts are a sequel of salmon patches caused by migration and proliferation of the retinal pigment epithelium. You might also see refractile spots which are old reabsorbed hemorrhages with hemocytor deposition within the inner retina, just beneath the internal limiting membrane. Proliferative sickle cell retinopathy includes the more advanced Goldberg stages, including the stage 3 finding pre-retinal C-fan neovascularization that also occurs at the posterior border. These C-fans form from local ischemia and upregulation of VEGF. A way to differentiate between sickle cell retinopathy and proliferative diabetic retinopathy is that sickle cell retinopathy is more peripheral, and neovascularizations autoinfarct in sickle cell retinopathy, leading to the classic white C-fan appearance. Uncontrolled neovascularization can lead to vitreous hemorrhage and tractional retinal detachment, which are vision-threatening complications from the disease. A patient presenting to the ophthalmology office would ideally be asymptomatic. However, when symptoms do occur, they are varied both among and within genotypes. The findings most consistent with genotypes is that hemoglobin SC genotypes tend to present earlier with proliferative sickle cell retinopathy. This finding is highest between 15 to 24 years in male patients and 20 to 39 years in female patients. 
On the other hand, hemoglobin SS disease presents later, usually between 25 to 39 years in both male and female patients. Sickle cell disease is diagnosed using electrophoresis of the hemoglobin protein, which will show a different migration rate through the gel between the sickling protein and the normal protein. For a diagnosis of sickle cell retinopathy, physicians will need a history of sickle cell disease or a new diagnosis by electrophoresis, fundoscopic evaluation, and fluorescein angiography to assess the stage of the retinopathy. There are not any current scientifically based screening guidelines. However, it is strongly recommended to refer a patient with sickle cell disease to a retina specialist at age 10 for hemoglobin SC or age 13 for hemoglobin SS. These patients should be followed for re-examination every one to two years when there is no evidence of retinopathy. Patients with sickle cell trait and simultaneous systemic vascular conditions, such as hypertension, should undergo similar screening methods. Additionally, any African-American patient presenting with a traumatic hyphema should be screened for sickle cell disease to prevent complications from the rigid sickled erythrocytes that may lead to difficult to control high intraocular pressure causing ischemic optic neuropathy. We will finish this lecture with the treatment options available for sickle cell retinopathy. Treatment is not recommended for non-proliferative sickle cell retinopathy and should be focused on controlling systemic sickle cell disease. Scatter retinal laser photocoagulation is the mainstay of treatment in proliferative sickle cell retinopathy stages 3 and 4. However, small C fans can be managed with observation as they might auto-infarct, resolving on their own. The goal of this therapy is to prevent progression to stage 5, the vision-threatening complication of the disease. This therapy decreases oxygen demand of the retina and the levels of VEGF. A complication from this procedure is retinal tears. Tears occur more frequently following laser treatment in sickle cell retinopathy than proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Therefore, a risk-benefit discussion should be performed with the patient. Finally, vitreoretinal surgery is reserved to treat the complications from proliferative sickle cell retinopathy, such as non-cloating vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachment. I hope you have found this lecture helpful. Thank you very much for your time and attention.